most religions worship God, one God or the other. But not most, but all religions. Of course, some will worship a cow, some will worship an image they themselves create. Like the like Sarah says, they are the ones who created it, then they turn out to pray to it. And yet they know they are the ones who did it. But in Christianity, we are called Christians because we believe God the way he was introduced by Christ. That's why we call groups that do not accept Christ as God together with the Father and the Holy Spirit as cults. And in the book of Colossians, Paul is taking trouble to emphasize to the church at Colossae that you, there is no Christianity without Christ being accepted as God. That is not a prophet, he is not, a, he is, he is not um, an angel. He is a creator himself, therefore he is God. And that's why they call it the mystery of Trinity, but Paul doesn't call it Trinity. It's the theologians who call it Trinity. What they are saying is, we may not fully understand, but Jesus is God, just like Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And there are not three gods, it's one God. Now, of course, that becomes a mystery, because now cults are in two extremes. You have cults that emphasize that because God is one, Jesus cannot be God. He is a God, but not God himself. And that's what the Jehovah Witnesses emphasize. That they are witnesses of Jehovah. Jesus is not God. And obviously they have to struggle with the book of Colossians that they say, no, 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 no. Jesus is the creator. And there are many cults of that level where Christ is not taken as the equal equal with God, despite all the teachings of the New Testament. But then there is another set of cults. I think the Marion Branham, the time believers, that's one of the things I understood them to be teaching. Not like your veterans. Now for them, they teach that um, that that. Christ is not different from the Father because after all God is one. If God is one, then you see Jesus, you have seen the Father. Yes? When you see the when you see, there's no Father. There's no Holy Spirit. It's one. It's only he appears in differently in different dispensation. There's a dispensation of the Father, dispensation of the Son, Dispensation of the Holy Spirit, but it's God appearing in different dispensations. Again, you have to struggle with uh, the baptism of John, uh, in the, the by John of Jesus Christ. At that point, <laughs> the Godhead was all there because the Son is in the water. He had become man and was being baptized. The father talked from heaven. This is my beloved son. The voice of the father was heard. And then the Holy Spirit came like a dove. So you therefore can't argue that, that, uh, that um, there is no three in one. That it is one in one. So the book of Colossians is actually very critical because it helps us to unravel this. And to accept, whether you want to use the word Trinity as a mystery or not, that the Bible does teach very clearly that Christ is God and that he is co-equal with the Father. And that when we, when we therefore we see him, we have seen God. But yet there is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are not three gods, one God, yet three persons in one. 
obviously not um, impossible for God to do, because that's why he is God and he's not man. But certainly impo impossible for us human beings to understand. Very difficult. But Paul puts it very in a nice language and he says, now, as much as he is the one who wrote maybe one half of the New Testament, he says, now I see through a mirror darkly. <laughs> but my time is coming when I'll see him face to face. So even at the very best of the theologians, we still have to live that there is information that God has not revealed yet. And if you believe he is there, then you believe he has a right to determine what to reveal and what not to reveal. Just, just let's look at Colossians chapter 1 from verse 15, talking about the supremacy of Christ, the Son of God. The Son is the image of the invisible God, verse 15 says, the firstborn of our creation. For in him... All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God has not pleased to, was not pleased to have all his fullness. For God was pleased to have all his fullness in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you are alienated from God and your enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior, but now he, this son, has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from all accusation. Verse 23, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you had and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. You see, every time I read this passage, I remember 1975. Um, I was then a university student in, in a conference. In, in a conference in um, in um, Mukono, Uganda. It was called Bishop Taka Theological College. That's where the focus, which was then one one body for the, for the three countries of East Africa was having his annual conference. And our speaker was the late Bishop Kivengere. And he really made this passage come out clear, clear to me. And that Christ is God. All the things we talk about, the Father creating, the Son is also creating. Because he is part of the Godhead. So he Paul argues clearly why Christ is God in order to show us clearly that um, he is not a human being, he is not an angel, he is God. And you must know this Christ as God, unlike what the cults have been discussing, talk about. Look at verse 15. The Son the Christ is the image of the invisible God, the first of all creation. So why do we say Christ is God? Because according to Paul he is the image 
of the invisible God. It's like a photograph. You have taken a photograph of your, of your grandson and you are showing somebody. Oh, look at my grandson. Now, <laughs> it's weird, you know, my, your grandson is all the way in America, but you are showing your friend, oh, look at my grandson. It's not really the glass, grandson we are looking at. We are looking at the image of your grandson. And Paul is saying, Christ is God. Why? He's is actually the image of God. When you see him, you have seen God. And I think that's a very, very important thing to talk about, the image of the invisible God. You know, religion, other than Christianity, is man reaching God. When you talk about Islam, it is Muhammad trying to reach out to God, finding out what God says. Whether it's racism, whether it's whatever you go to, Hinduism, man is trying to reach God. Christianity, God himself has come down. In other words, God has told you how to worship him. That's why we are very different, because in seeing God, Christ, you are seeing God himself, and he tells you how he should be worshipped. That's something that you need to ask yourself. You know, sometimes we want to create God in our own image. You know, Genesis tells us that God created man in his own image. Because we don't want like this idea of something we cannot fathom, we like to reduce God to our level. So man creates God in man's image. In fact, sometimes we imagine like God can't hear, God can't see. That's why you will find somebody who is living immoral life. And on Sunday is a big preacher. His God is a God who is with damp and deaf and can't see, can't hear. But we are learning. If you really want to know God, then you see the Son, you see Jesus Christ. He is the invisible, the invisible image of God. Then he is called the firstborn, the firstborn of all creation. Remember, he is the creator. Then in Mary, he becomes man. And he is not becoming man, you know, just like that. He is man special. He is the firstborn. That's why he is the first one to ever resurrect and, ne ne and not die again. Because that makes him the firstborn of all creation. In other words, he is created, but not quite a creation. It's a special type of creation. Because he is a creator. He is a created uh, cre creator. The firstborn of all the land. So, and that tells you he is not at our level. Just like in the Jewish tradition, the firstborn always had a double portion of the inheritance. That's why we also pray in his name. So it's important to understand if he is the firstborn, it's true that God, who is born by Mary, is a creation. But it's not a creation, just another. That's why we know that he has a mother, but has no father. He's a firstborn of all creation. Can you then see he's not, a, he's not like another prophet? Look at verse 16. For in him all things were created. You hear that? He can't be human. Why? In him all things were created. So he is a creator. He created all things. Hence, he can handle anything. That, that's why we are able to pray to Jesus, to him, because we know any problem on earth, he can handle. Exactly the same way we are told about the, the, the story of Ford, <laughs> how, how he, as an old man retired, he was driving a Ford car, which is uh, he's a designer, 
and he found somebody on the road with a vehicle on the roadside unable to go on because his vehicle was having trouble. And he asked the young man, what's the trouble with your car? The young man looked at the old man and wondered why bother him or would he understand anyway? The old man insisted, may I help? Now since he insisted, he, the, the, the young man moved aside. Obviously he said, try the car. A few touches, he knows the engine, he designed it. And the car was moving. So he said, old man, who, who are you? He said, Mr. Ford. That's when the boy realized he would have missed help. You know, well, the moment you understand that Christ is the creator of all things, it means whatever problem we have, whether economic, environmental, medical, all the problems you have, you can turn back to God. Because, like Ford, if the engine is not working and he's a designer, he's most likely the one who can fix it. What kind of things does he create? He says, things in heaven. That's why they don't start saying, I saw a vision, I was in heavens, I saw dream, I had dreams of angels, what not. They are all his creation. The devil is God's devil. He is God's creation. He is rebellious, but was created by God because he created things in heaven. But even things on earth. You know, man, anything he invents, he's inventing something that God, out of what God created in the first place. But it all goes on to say, even visible things, any visible thing, God has created it. But even invisible ones. Like, for example, have you ever seen electricity? Have you seen an angel? Have you ever seen the demonic world that has so much on our spiritual being of human beings? Even that is his creation. That's why you need to understand the demonic world. God is still in charge. For the time being, he has allowed them their rebellion, but the day is coming when every demon and the devil himself, according to the book of Revelation, will be thrown into the lake of fire. He is the creator of the invisible world. And we are talking about whether you are talking about small people or big ones, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, spiritual or not spiritual, all things have been created through him and for him. Have you heard it? In him, he, all things are created in him. All things are created through him. All things are created for him. In him, it means he's a, he's, he's a creator. Through him, he is, the, he is the process. He's the one in charge of the process. For him means that he his one who determines what to do with what is being created. It's actually created for him so that he can use it. That's why you are best, you are your best, you are your best time when you worship God, when you recognize him. Because he, you are created to worship him. You are created to adore him. And the moment you become rebellious, you are the one who will suffer. Because you are the one who is not being what you are created for. You are out of place. Unless you worship, we were created for him. I think that's something very, very important. Can you then see he can't be a prophet? He cannot be an angel. Because he's saying he's the one who has created the angels. How could he be then be an angel? Then in verse 17, he says, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. What are we saying? Things hold together because of him. If he ever was to remove himself from, from it, they would not hold together. He is before things means he is not at the level of all things. He's above them. All things, angels, prophets, he's above all of them. That's what verse 17 is saying. He be, and then verse 17 goes on to say, in him all things hold together. That's why the earth doesn't fall off and it's not lying on anything according to, 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 to what you are taught. That's why the stars don't fall off. The way he has created them and 
fix them in various places, they hold together. He is a creator, he's a force behind it. Then in verse 18, he goes on, he goes on to say, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that everything in everything he might have the supremacy. What are we learning? That we have now seen he is the creator. The second thing is the church itself is his church. That's why it is uh, very interesting when you see some, some pastors putting their picture and their wives on a board, come to church. How can I come to your church? The church does not belong to any human being. He is saying he is the head of the church. He's the head of the body, the church. The pope is not the head. The, the apostle is not the head. The bishop, he has declared himself the head of the church. So if you are the head of your church, it's not Christ's church. When Christ, Christ is in charge of his church, even the very biggest senior pastor, whom we only call senior pastor, is a servant of the owner of the church. Anything we do, we do as stewards of the owner. He's not at our level. He is the head of the church. And he is the beginning. He founded the church. And if you can go on, he is the firstborn from the dead. Just to show you that, um, that, that he is not at our level. We believe that even if we die, we shall resurrect. Why? Because he is the one who has promised us and he himself became human, died on the cross. On the third day, he rose again, becoming the very first person to ever resurrect. Of course, I've heard of other people who have resurrected. The difference between that resurrection and that of Christ is that soon after that, they later die. They may live another 10 years, 20 years, but they still die. The only person we don't have in a grave is Jesus Christ because he rose again to live forevermore. He's not, that's why you need to understand he is not at our level. He's the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything, he must have the supremacy. So therefore, there is nothing you can compare. He's supreme in every, in every way. And I think that will be something you have to, to be aware, aware of in supremacy. Look at verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness during him. Okay, getting it. The Father is fully in the Son. So when you see the Son, you are seeing God. Why? Verse 19 is saying, for God was pleased to have all his fullness in him. Are you understanding? It means that when you see the Son, when you talk to Jesus Christ, you are not talking to a human being who has an anointing from God. You are talking about the fullness of God. And I think that will be something very, very important for you, for us to understand. All of God is in Jesus. Not a part of it. He's not a second God. He's part of God. Because all the fullness of God is in him. And that's why we keep saying it's a mystery. Because they are not... Ex there is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, yet they are still one. The fullness of God is in the, in the Son. I think that will be, be important. Then finally in verse 20, we read, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, You know, the whole sentence starts from verse 18. And he is the head of the church. Then verse 20. And through him, the head of the church, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, 
by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So this God we are learning is the same one that became man and actually died on the cross. How can God die on the cross? He did. Why? Because he was looking for a way of reconciling sinful man back to God. That's really what he was, that's why he was, why he was, he was dying. In order to create a friendship, a reconciliation between man and God. Friendship with, with us is only possible because the penalty of sin, because we are sinful people. We can't relate with the Holy God. But then he shed his blood so that now, because the penalty is paid, we can relate with God. Through Christ and his blood, he reconciles every human being who is willing back into friendship with God. And so we can be friends with, with the God. Why? Not because we have never sinned, but because we are forgiven if we accept our sinfulness and claim the blood of Jesus Christ. Accept that Christ died for our sins. So when a Christian is saying, I'm going to heaven, it's not because they are holy, it's because Christ is holy. It's not because they have never sinned, it's because they know Christ has forgiven them their sins. So that, that's a Christ that um, we are dealing with. And uh, Paul wanted the, the, the Colossians to have a clear understanding of who they have trusted in. It's he who is God, all-powerful, choosing to become man so that he can reconcile man, sinful man, to a holy God. And through him, through Christ, we are reconciled to God. And everything gets a reconciliation. Things on earth or things in heaven. Why? He is making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So blood is very critical. That's why whoever uses the cross as a mark of Christianity is right. Because it is that cross that accomplishes a reconciliation between sinful man and holy God. That's what we are, that's what we are, we are, we are learning. He made peace to enemies, to two enemies. Man, fallen man, is an enemy of God because he has chosen not to obey God, not to walk with God and has chosen to be rebellious. Is that so? Then we can relate with the Father. But if the blood, you know, it says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin, the Bible tells us. Now, once the blood is shed, then we are forgiven. In the Old Testament, you have to keep killing goats, keep killing them, keep killing them. And you kill them for yesterday's sin, you have to kill them again. But because now Christ himself came, and shed blood, there is no more sacrifice necessary because now you no longer need to sacrifice animals because Christ himself has become man and died on the cross for us. And I think that's, uh, that will be important. So have you seen then how important it is to know the supremacy of Christ, that Christ is God the creator, that Christ is the head of the church, and that Christ is the reconciler of man back to himself. And we remain in friendship with him because we now know him as God. So we worship God. And in fact, that's why whenever we are praying to God, we always say, in the name of Jesus. In other words, referring to the sacrifice he had on the cross. So you can't pray the way you used to pray among your ancestors who are praying. Can't pray the same way other cults are praying. You pray anything you ask in my name, in Christ's name. It's what will be done. If you wanted the Father to do anything for you, 
you must recognize the place of the Son. May we truly give him supremacy and worship him.